Alarm bells ringing across Europe as the balance of power seems to be changing in Poland. The lower house of parliament approving a bill that allows for the dismissal of Supreme Court justices. This after last Friday's legislation that lets lawmakers pick judges. The reigning end of the judiciary started when the right-wing populist Law and Justice Party came to power in 2015 and stacked the Constitutional Tribunal with loyalists. It's all got the European Union considering the unprecedented step of suspending Poland's voting rights in Brussels. Is that a case of uh, meddling in domestic affairs? Or does the change in Poland's balance of power undermine the core values it adhered to when it joined the EU back in 2004. We're going to gauge the mood in Warsaw and that growing rift across the continent. Already, neighboring Hungary has said it would veto any sanctions against Poland. As differences become irreconcilable between Eurozone members and Central European nations that are proving increasingly illiberal on issues like freedom of the press, protection of the rights of minorities and refugees, after Brexit, what's the tipping point at which the EU faces more divorces? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking if Polish democracy is, as the opposition contends, under threat. And with us from Warsaw, British-Polish attorney Nicholas Richardson, the blogger at The Polished Lawyer. Should I say The Polished Lawyer or The Polished Lawyer? Which, which, which is it? Well, it, it, it's actually Polished Lawyer. It's supposed to be a pun on Polished and Polished. Okay. <laughs> we'll say Polished. Many thanks. Uh, from Brussels, Dominika Kozic, correspondent for Polish state television broadcaster TVP. Welcome to the show. Good evening. David Cadier, a Frenchman in the Polish capital. He's associate fellow at the foreign policy think tank LSE Ideas. Nice to see you. Good evening. And here in the studio, Alexis Poulin, co-founder of the online magazine Le Monde Moderne, The Modern World, which uh, looks at uh, how this world is changing. As the Yeah, the revolutions that are uh, actually happening in politics, in economics, uh, in everything with the robots coming, the artificial intelligence, and uh, well, everyone is impacted right now, and the new world coming. All right, disruption all around, disruption inside of Poland and the European Union. You've been weighing in on the conversation on the France 24 debates, uh, Facebook page and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. It is a tighter leash. Uh, Simon Harding has more on this latest bill, that is now headed to the Senate before going to the president's desk. A crisis which continues to grow. Angry scenes in the Polish parliament as MPs approved the controversial Supreme Court bill, which would allow the government to replace judges. The opposition, rights group and the European Union say the reforms undermine the separation of power between the executive and the judiciary and bring the courts under the government's control. Each individual law, if adopted, would seriously erode the independence of the Polish judiciary. Collectively, they would abolish any remaining judicial independence and put the judiciary under full political control of the government. Protests erupted after the ruling Law and Justice Party passed two bills last Friday, giving Parliament a greater say in appointing judges. The decision has sparked outrage across Poland, many claiming that the changes are unconstitutional and violate Polish law. The Law and Justice Party wants to take over all the power, every kind of power, including executive and legislative power, and also judicial power. The president proposed to replace one bill that breaks the constitution with another bill that also breaks the constitution. This doesn't make any difference. The ruling party have claimed that the changes will modify an inefficient court system, a view which is shared by many experts and judges. But they have also said that the law and justice proposals are leading Poland the wrong way. Uh, Nicholas Richardson, the uh, leader of the uh, uh, ruling party, uh, Yaroslav Kaczynski, insists that uh, the justice system needs this reform because it still works along communist era lines. What's your experience? Well, my experience as a lawyer, my experience of the justice system is it, 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 it is at times infuriatingly slow. And no doubt, because Poland very wisely, perhaps at the time of the changes following the fall of the communists in 1989, decided not to have a wholesale removal of everybody, you may have some people lurking in the judiciary who, who think in the old way. 
Um, and as with any system involving humans, you have corruption. But whether the corruption is as widespread as the party leader is suggesting as a way of justifying the, this, these rather alarming changes is, is, I think, open to debate. Is I it a power many... grab? Sorry? Is it a power grab? Well, it, it appears to be a power grab. No doubt, as, as, as with your earlier correspondent said, no doubt individually each of these changes might be acceptable. The problem is they are part of a series of changes which have been started with the Constitutional Tribunal, which itself decided whether, whether new laws are in fact in accordance with the Constitution, and changes to the way the, the, uh, the, the, the public media function, which leads it to look very much like a power grab. Essentially, you now have one party, if these, if these reforms actually go ahead, you will have one party deciding um, who the Constitutional Tribunal is and, and who the judges at every level of society are, and therefore you would have to have people of the utmost probity and great, almost superhuman experience to assume that you would therefore not have a scope for a different sort of corruption. Dominika Kozic, you agree? I have mixed opinion because in Poland, in fact, it was a problem with some judges which have been still from the regime, a communist regime. And it was for me as a relatively young person, very difficult to imagine that uh, the judges who have judged uh, Polish uh, oppositions, uh, politicians from anti-communist uh, uh, oppositions, now they are still judging people. And uh, it should be kind of transformation in the Polish legal system. It should be replaced those uh, corrupted, those uh, judges who have been a very, a very negative uh, opinion. They should be replaced by, by younger people. And it was a problem also, another problem in Poland, because it was a lot of story that it is uh, this, our legal system is like, uh, I don't want to use too, too strong word, but it is a little bit like mafia, because it was very close system. And when you have been apart from the system, it, you, it was very difficult to you to become a judge. And it was true, because I have lots of friends who have finished the law, they are, um, they are working in the legal system and they have very big problem to become judge because it is very close, very uh, close circle. And uh, now this uh, reform proposed by government is going to the, this direction to open this, uh, this profession also to younger people, to people who are not from the system, to make this more democratic and more open to people who are not uh, taking part in the system. It is one point. Of course, there are a lot uh, the problem is in the details, as we in, in Poland we say. I hope that may, that it will go to the good direction. Unfortunately, now in Poland, it is uh, this reform is using by politicians to make political dispute, and now it is uh, in Poland. It is I have impression that it is more political rumor than a, legal, than a so, discussion about uh, concrete legal proposals. So, Dominika, you're, you're saying that you need a renewal of, uh, of the judges who've been there for too long, some of them corrupt. But doesn't this neuter the judiciary and put it under the control of the president and parliament? Not exactly, because uh, I had, I know, as I know, a quite similar system is also now in, for example, the Netherlands and other countries, even Germany. So the proposal which, we, which is proposed in Poland is going to this, in this direction. The question, of course, is uh, how it will work, how it will be looking in the practice. I hope that it will work. If, uh, but uh, first, we should give a chance uh, to change this, and then we we'll, uh, observe this very carefully. David Cadier, give it a chance. Well, uh, it's, it's a difficult topic. I, I think right now uh, there are a lot of uncertainties because what's happening is that these new measures first contain elements on the nomination uh, of judges in those future instances, but also concretely means that a lot of judges will be fired. So in other words, some people will be fired, but institutions will remain in place. And what people are worried about is how those institutions will be filled with new people and whether the political power will uh, actually scrupulously respect the rule of law in filling these positions and also in interacting with this judicial branch of the, of the power, which, as, as Montesquieu uh, reminded us, should be separated from the legislative and the executive branch of power. Do you have the feeling that Poland's at a turning point? 
Well, um, I think it's honestly too soon to say because uh, it's going to be a lot about how the uh, Polish civil uh, society reacts. Uh, and this we can really uh, uh, know yet. So I think it's not a turning point because it's something that has been in the making for some time, that's been gradual, that uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a coup overnight, uh, but there's been some sign before with the uh, Constitutional Tribunal uh, reform six months ago. So uh, it's not a turning point yet, but it's a direction that worries some people in Brussels at least. Uh, our our uh, Poland correspondent, uh, Gulliver Craig, telling us that uh, there are again protest rallies uh, this uh, Thursday, this time um, under the window of the uh, president, uh, hoping that he'll uh, veto uh, the measure, the president who's aligned with the, the, the ruling PIS uh, uh, party. Uh, Alexei Poulin, is this a done deal and is this a sort of a point of no return for Poland? I don't know if it's a done deal. Uh, there'll be uh, another debate uh, at the other chamber tomorrow, and uh, the president said that he could veto the text in his actual form, so we don't know what's going to happen, uh, given uh, the, the power of the street uh, and, and, uh, and the, the lawmaker in Poland. We'll have to discuss further on, on, on this. Um, what is there, and, and what was said before, is that it's a, it's a long process. It's not just uh, overnight that they decided to change the uh, law system in Poland. Uh, it's been months that they've been rift with uh, the EU Commission, and Timmermans has been always talking about Poland and saying, you can't do this, it's anti-constitutional, uh, and, and we'll have to, to fight. And the issue here, I think, is how you actually write the law, and if you don't have opposition in the Parliament, then you are in a standby. There's an issue of being having too much power and one party in power is back to the communist era. It's like, uh, I don't think Poles want that. And you mentioned communists and you mentioned Franz Timmermans, the number two of the European Commission, telling reporters on Wednesday, quote, what is happening in Poland affects the union as a whole. We're talking about the very building blocks of what the EU and our societies are. I will do everything I can and I feel the 100% support of all my colleagues in the college for that, to make sure that Poland sticks to a development that fosters the rule of law, democracy, openness, the freedom of the media, market economy, opportunity for all. This is the clear choice that was made by the Polish people when they freed themselves from communist oppression. Dominika Kozic, what is your reaction to those words? They are very strong words, and, but I have the impression that Commissioner Timmermans, from the beginning of this conflict, uh, he's taking one uh, very strong position. He's uh, supporting opposition in Poland. Sometimes he's uh, not enough neutral, in, at least in my opinion. I give you one example. It was, I think, two months ago he came to Poland for the invitation of one of the leading journal, daily newspaper, Gazeta Wyborcza, which is also now taking part in the internal Polish conflict. And uh, Mr. Timmermans came for, to Poland for invitation of Gazeta Wyborcza to receive a award, special, uh, special award of uh, Gazeta Wyborcza. The pe person who is uh, contributing in changing of uh, political situation, it was a uh, man of the year of Gazeta Wyborcza. And he came to Poland. And he was also invited by Polish uh, mi uh, Vice uh, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Minister of uh, European Affairs, to, the, to meet. And he avoided. He told to us, to journalists, that he will not meet with uh, Polish politicians because it is Brussels, the place in which uh, he can meet Polish politicians, and he has nothing to say more. And he came for this uh, event organizing by Gazeta Wyborcza. It was kind of political signal that he's supporting one side of pol uh, Polish political conflict. And it was not good, in my opinion, because he lost many people who were, until this moment, uh, admiring even Mr. Timmermans and uh, respecting him very much, uh, very much uh, now changed position because he, they told that now he's not more neutral. That's a pity, because the European Commission should be respected and should have a kind of respect uh, between pe people and politicians in Poland. And uh, this comment, uh, the, this uh, statement of uh, Mr. Timmermans, I, t I took part yesterday in this conference, uh, press conference. It was uh, strong, and it is, uh, 
it is clear signal from him, him that he will be very hard uh, fighter with uh, against Polish government. But he said Polish he said at that very press conference, Dominika. He also said that. Uh, uh, officials at the uh, commission, and also we've heard this from the former Polish prime minister, the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, they're irked by the fact that uh, they wanted to talk about all this with the authorities in Warsaw and that the authorities in Warsaw ignored them. That's a problem. That's it, true. It is a problem. The problem, in my opinion, is also kind of language which is using by some Polish politicians and uh, some even some representative of the uh, government side. From the beginning of uh, this conflict, now it is a little bit changing, but the very beginning of uh, this um, uh, rule of law procedure, it was a uh, few mistakes making by Polish government. It was also the, uh, the question of language using in the conversation between and correspondence between Polish uh, politicians and the European Commission. It was too much too many emotional language, too, many, uh, too much emotions, and it was too strong. Instead of uh, legal arguments uh, like it is making, for example, uh, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who knows very well how to speak to European Commission. He's using only this legal language, he's uh, using only legal arguments, and he's not using emotions. It was a mistake. Right, let me, let me, uh, let later me on, it was better because uh, it, uh, the language has. Let me, let me bring in, let me bring in just quickly before the break. Poland, Poland. Uh, just let me bring in Alexei mm -hmm. Poulin with your reaction to that. Well, it's just a game that has been played by all uh, national leaders uh, putting the European Commission as the big Satan and saying, oh, they want to steal our freedom, they're here to dictate uh, the rule of law in our countries. Uh, this is populism. It's been there forever, even in France, uh, and we've seen it. It led to Brexit. Uh, it's not. Uh, uh, it's the way policies are done and politics, the political game is done. Uh, which I, I don't think uh, is new. Um, what, what is new here, I think, is that uh, uh, this is, uh, Poland and Hungary and are very anti-European in many ways, uh, and they will lead to sort of uh, get the lead of what used to be uh, the UK before Brexit. Uh, and and, and carving, out, carving out a place for themselves. We're going to yes. pick up on that point. Okay. When we come back, stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and we're seeing a war of words uh, between Poland and Brussels after the passage of two measures in under a week that really put the judiciary under a much tighter leash in Poland. The latest piece of legislation that's now headed from the lower house to the Senate uh, would uh, reign in the Supreme Court with us to talk about it. Uh, British Polish attorney Nicholas Richardson, blogger at the Pol Pol Polished Lawyer, who joins us from Warsaw. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to uh, Dominika Kozic, Brussels correspondent for Publish uh, uh, Broadcaster PTV. Uh, also with us, uh, David Cadier, uh, who is with the think tank, uh, uh, the uh, LSE Ideas, who is in the Polish capital. And here we're in the company of Alexis uh, Poulin who is uh, one of the men who runs the uh, mod Le Monde Moderne, the modern world, the uh, web magazine site. Uh, now, uh, the man seen as the real person in charge in Poland, Jaroslaw Kaczynski, leader of the ruling Law and Justice Party, calling any outside pressure from, from uh, uh, Brussels, quote, an abuse of their powers. He doesn't hold back against opponents, Kaczynski, be they foreign or domestic, like during this heated exchange Wednesday in Parliament when he alluded to the death of his twin brother, the country's former president, who died in a plane crash a few years back. Don't wipe your treacherous mouths with my late brother's name. You destroyed him. You murdered him. You are scoundrels. Nicholas Richardson, what do you think of the, the tone of the debate in Parliament? Is it all personal or what do you make of, of the remarks you just heard there from Kaczynski? Well, I, I can understand that obviously to lose your twin brother in tragic circumstances is immensely upsetting. Uh, but these remarks from a party leader, the way they were done in Parliament, he didn't actually bother to follow the parliamentary procedure. He sort of barged his way to the rostrum to make his speech. 
He was later caught on, on camera, I think, threatening um, opposition deputies that they would be imprisoned by October or November or some sort of time. So, yes, it has become very personal. Um, and the, the tragedy is that was a, a, an air crash, pilot error, question whether the pilots were persuaded or led to believe that they might try again to land the plane when they, had they been left to their own devices, might not have. Uh, but these things have happened. You can't sort of seek to punish a country or punish that half of the country, which is not your natural supporter, merely because you suffered a family tragedy. And I think this has become, as you say, very, very personal. And it's, it's a shame. And the way this legislation was passed with a couple of late night sittings, with yesterday the opposition tabled 1,300 amendments, those amendments were voted out of, out of they weren't even considered, and that, that, and that we have allegedly this problem with post-communist um, um, corruption, the irony will not have been lost on observers that the man chosen by the Law and Justice Party to push through this legislation was himself a public prosecutor under the last communist regime and was honoured by the communists. Now, of course, much joy over the sinner who repenteth. Uh, but the idea that you, you, you have some sort of blanket problem with post-communists, so you'll just make sure that your Minister of Justice can sort of take over the legal system, is a strange argument. If there are corrupt judges, and nobody would say there aren't, then identify the corrupt judges and, and do something about it. But do this in a way where you consult everybody in power, you consult Parliament, because I'm sure the opposition would have been as happy as law and justice to take part in a, and, and to pass legislation which would have allowed dealing with specific cases of corrupt judges. But to say, well, we, we think we know better and the Constitution's in our way and we can't change the Constitution because we don't have the two-thirds majority, but we will sort of do other manoeuvres to get it in the same direction is, I think, extraordinary in a country which has made such great progress in the last 25 years. And it would be a shame to see us having a return to a system whereby the power is an actual fact not vested in the president or the prime minister or the government, but it's sort of run by the, the, the party leader who has no other official position. It is, whether it's intended to be or not, it looks very like a return to an old way of, an old way of business, of, of single party rule, uh, which would be very unfortunate for all concerned. All right, the bill is still to go to the Senate, then the president is, it, it, it'll go to the president's desk. Uh, Nicholas, uh, is all this going to become law? Will it be then struck down by the European Court of Justice? What, what's going to happen? Well, if it all well, I, on past on past um, practice, it seems unlikely. The Senate, I think, last week on the on the on the other part of the uh, the legislation, w was able to do it very quickly and, and supported it. Um, everybody's hope, and that's why there are so many uh, demonstrations across Poland tonight, is that the president will recover. Um, his, um, his, um, his remember that he is in fact a trained lawyer, um, and, and will will show some respect for and will, and will veto this legislation on the grounds that it, that it does put too much political par power in one party. Of course, he, this, this is the political party of which he he was a member. I know that the president is supposed, in fact, on assuming the presidency, to renounce political allegiances. Uh, but on past practice, he 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 really has obviously supported whatever has come out of Parliament. Uh, a parliament dominated by his his former party. So I wouldn't be holding my breath that he's actually going to veto it. I mean, we can only hope that you know, when you're president, you're president of all the polls, not necessarily those polls who just voted for you. And he'll take account of the international um, uh, worry. He'll take account of citizens who have been on the streets for several days running in a very peaceful way, uh, trying to express their discomfort at what might happen. Uh, and one would, one would hate that he would take that into account. But I, I, if I was a bat betting man, I wouldn't be putting much money on it. Wouldn't be putting much money on it. And should uh, the um, European Commission be triggering Article 7, that is to say, suspending Poland's voting rights in the EU? Well, I think the, the problem with the, the problem with, with the with the European Commission is that this is the nuclear option which has never been used before. Uh, but from their point of view, they have tried discussions, they, they've tried to be reasonable. I mean, nobody is denying that there may be a problem which needs sorting out. But as I say, the, the, the problem here is not that any individual piece of legislation is in itself necessarily unwelcome. The problem is it's part of a series of actions which have suddenly left the, the rule of law in extreme danger. The rule of law means, in actual fact, everybody from the president downwards is subject to the same law, not subject to arbitrary power. And we will be left with, if all these acts of parliament uh, if that take effect, to the system whereby essentially the Minister of Justice, which in this case, given the way the Law and Justice Party works, means uh, the party leader, Mr. Kaczynski, is essentially able to call the shots. 
laws can be passed and you say, well, this law is unconstitutional, but you've already packed the constitutional tribunal with, with people who are your chums. So if I have a problem, I take it to the court. But again, the courts could in theory be packed with people who've been appointed by the same, by the same little process. And there is the danger that there's now no, no limit other than the good intentions of those involved are, are on complete power being assumed by one party. All right. Uh, on the hashtag F24 debate, lots of reactions. Uh, one prediction here. Article 7 shall be activated. Alexis Poulain, you, do you agree with that prediction that uh, the European Commission is going to suspend Poland's voting rights? I think it's going to be delicate. I, the, the, the problem with the EU is uh, you have to put diplomacy forward and, and, and see how you can continue building the EU. The, the question is, is this the, the first step towards uh, an exit of Poland, like, like the Brexit? Uh, and that's the question we have to ask. And Timmermans is right to remember uh, what, what the EU is about, which is freedom of the press, freedom of movement, free market, and, and, the, and the rule of law. Uh, and the fact that a democracy is about separation of power. And if you move towards uh, concentrating all the power into one party, uh, then we have an issue here uh, for Europe. So Article 7 uh, could be triggered to um, show, lead by example, and saying this is enough is enough uh, with this country from Visegrad, Poland, uh, Hungary that are not respecting uh, what, what was the initial deal. Uh, so that, that could be uh, one way of doing it. But I, I find it quite um, violent, maybe, uh, towards uh, Brussels standards, uh, given that uh, there is still room uh, for, for speaking and, and the law hasn't passed. All right. At the start of the month, uh, Donald Trump was in Poland. The highlight was a speech at the Warsaw Uprising Memorial where he praised Poland's leadership. He got uh, lots of applause uh, from supporters of the PIS. And uh, he asked uh, whether the West has the will to survive in his speech to defend its values. David Kedier, he uh, never American mentioned the word democracy, it seems, in that speech. Uh, what do you make of, uh, of that visit in the context of the discussion we're having right now? I think you're right to point out that this speech happened a couple of days before these this new measures were introduced. Uh, and indeed, Donald Trump, on one hand, provided some reassurances on a, a U.S. support uh, uh, to NATO, uh, made some comments on Russia that were uh, eagerly awaited here in, in Warsaw, but he also had another part of his discourse, a very clash of civilization discourse. He didn't talk about democracy, but he talked a lot about civilization, about the West, uh, with this idea that uh, to survive in globalization, Western nations need to be true to themselves, be true to the traditional values. And this is pretty much the discourse of the current government here in, in, in Warsaw. So uh, did they feel emboldened by uh, uh, the backing of, of such a powerful ally, uh, it could be, especially as, as we heard uh, in the EU context, uh, Poland is uh, increasingly isolated because of these, uh, of, these, of these policies. And actually, may I also come back on what will happen and the Article 7 uh, uh, question? Because the, the Article 7 uh, is often referred to as the nuclear option. And it's called nuclear for a reason, because it's an option of last resort and because it could be pretty uh, devastating. As was mentioned, the context here is very polarized politically. It's also a partisan debate, and I agree that it's important that the EU Commission does not give the impression that it's supporting a party. The EU Commission is not supporting a party. The EU Commission is supporting the treaties. It's the gatekeeper of the treaties and of the, the values that underpin this uh, political community that is the EU. So we should also be careful with the discourse that try to personalize the debate and make it as an obsession of Mr. Timmermans, right? Which is in a way a convenient way for the authorities not to have uh, to respond to the real question that are, are triggered by uh, this set of, of measures. In this context, the EU need to thread very carefully because while it's important that it doesn't uh, stay without response where, while its core values are actually uh, encroached, uh, at the same time, it's important not to alienate the Polish population. While we might want in Brussels to have these laws amended somehow, we do not want to alienate the Polish population. And I think it's important not to stigmatize uh, a whole country. I think I heard that, that the Poles are not uh, pro-European. I, I beg to differ. Actually, when you look at the Poles, 
uh, the Polish population is actually rather pro-European. Uh, the thing, though, is that the EU Commission should be careful not to give a rhetorical ammunition to the authorities in their anti-allied discourse, in a way. Uh, and in that sense, the balance is to defend the values while not giving the impression that we're imposing uh, uh, something from outside. This is why, in my view, the solution is a depassionate debate unpersonalized, simply holding member states responsible for their engagement towards basic norms and values. All right. And on the hashtag F24 debate reactions, Trump puts Poland, which is sliding away from democracy, says Brian, on a pedestal as a model for the West. Empowered, they politicize the judiciary. Dominika Kozic, uh, how important was that visit by Donald Trump to Warsaw? It was very important because Polish people waited for this uh, speech of Donald Trump, especially that he mentioned Article 50 in the NATO Treaty. And it was very important on, for, for Polish people because we are afraid of Russia. And uh, Russia it is always, always has been very difficult for Poland's neighbors. And uh, now Russia is, may, uh, is very aggressive in her politics, international. Uh, it is our neighbor, as I mentioned. And uh, this uh, mention of Article 50 by Donald Trump was the most important part of his uh, speech in Poland. Also here that there was a very nice word about Polish history and po about Polish people. And it was a good moment, right moment for po Polish people. They wanted to hear something like this. And it was also a kind of point. But do you, do, you agree with the, the, do you agree with the other panelists? Uh, do you agree with David Cadier? Do you agree with David Cadier when he says that this uh, empowered uh, it sort of egged on those that uh, wanted to go through with this uh, change in, in the balance of power with the judiciary. I don't, I don't agree. I would like the, uh, just to think to, uh, I would like to add one thing that may uh, to remind that in the previous government, uh, when it was platform civic, it was, platform, uh, it was part of uh, Donald Tusk, current president of European Council, uh, then when they had power, it, they have also all in their hands. They had the president, they have government, they had the national television, they have all. They, all power has been in the hand of one party. So this situation now, now in Poland is not very unusual. It is uh, like a bit of a, a government of a, a platform civic. And second thing, I'm sorry that I will make, uh, uh, I will just, uh, change a little bit subject, uh, you mentioned uh, this uh, peaceful demonstration in Poland. Indeed, uh, most of the people who are demonstrating against this uh, change of law are absolutely peaceful and they are uh, just using democratic measures to show their emotions. But uh, there are unfortunate people, supporters of uh, opposition party who are attacking, physically attacking uh, my colleagues from state television and it was not one individual examples. It was many situations and uh, journalists uh, from public television are afraid to, co to cover issues, uh, de demonstrations like this because they are physically brutally attacking. It is very sad because it is kind of brutalization of language and uh, atmosphere in Poland, which is uh, very negative for all of us. I think that uh, now in Poland we need to take a breath and uh, we need to distance the, the less emotion. We should uh, try to talk between each other in less emotional but uh, more logical way. Nicholas Richardson, you agree? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't speak to the, I, the only coverage I've seen of these uh, these demonstrations, they, they've all been extremely peaceful and, and the, 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 the Polish uh, state state media is, is sort of all all dominating at the moment. So, I, I, but if there are individual cases of, 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 of brutality, that, that, that's very sad. Um, yeah, I think certainly Poland needs to take a breath. I, I don't agree with the idea that Donald Trump's speech egged anybody on. I think this was part of a long-standing um, plan on the part of law and justice to sort of reshape things in a way which they, they, they find more acceptable to their program. And I, and I come back to the point because I think it is an important point. It's probably harder for people who are not here to understand. There are a lot of grievances and, and amongst the natural supporters of the Law and Justice Party that things have improved dramatically in Poland since 1989, but a lot of their supporters, particularly those outside the large, the large cities, have not done as well um, as others have done. And there's always a suspicion 
in, in this part of the world that somebody has done better than you because they have some sort of influence which is secret and they've done some sort of dodgy deal with, with people. So I, I can understand that this basic need of the Law and Justice Party to, to be seen to be uh, doing something for its, for its own core supporters. But, but I also come back to the point, and obviously as a lawyer I would come back to this point, that I don't see there was any ill which had to be addressed which required the complete judicial power, he said ultimately, to be vested in in one or two or one or two individuals, uh, and you could argue, oh well, in in a in a couple of years' time there'll be elections and another party will come in and it'll all be wonderful. Of course, the, you know, the, looking at the, the the bleakest and probably slightly unrealistic scenario, the only reason you have an election in a, in a few years' time is because there's a law, and if you've taken the the power to to change the law and, and to actually neutralise anybody who might question your changing of the law, uh, then then the way is open for all sorts of things that we've seen in history. Uh, on, on, on all sides of the political divide, that if you have, you know, as Lord Acton reminded us, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the idea that any group of politicians, whether they're politicians you support or you, politicians you loathe, can actually be trusted of themselves with, with, with total power, uh, history has shown, us that, that, that has shown us that that is simply not the case. And that is why I think a lot of people are worried, because uh, about the changes in Poland, the potential they have, if carried out, for for people to be uh, you know in a, in a very difficult situation if they ever have a, to take action a, against arbitrary power in the future. Which brings us to uh, back to a point that uh, Alexis Poulin made at the end of uh, part one of our discussion um, on uh, the uh, where Poland is carving its place out within the European Union. Now uh, Poland's gotten the backing already of its neighbor to the south, Hungary. On Tuesday, the Polish Prime Minister was in Budapest for a summit with the Israeli. Uh, leader uh, and uh, also with the other leaders of the Visegrad group of nations that include the Czech Republic and Slovakia. There, the hosts agreed with Benjamin Netanyahu when he complained about tying economics to human rights, or as Viktor Orban of Hungary put it, the political preconditions imposed by the EU. The European Union should appreciate the efforts made by Israel for the stability of the region. It is both in the Israeli and European interest because they are protecting us from new migrant invasions. Yeah, a newer and newer migrant invasion. I see you rolling your eyes, countering uh, that argument. Uh, uh, are the Germans, who in a position paper back in May that uh, a Politico got wind of, pondered penalties mm -hmm. on uh, structural funds for nations that are net beneficiaries of EU financing. Berlin wants to uh, look into whether receipt of EU cohesion funds can be linked to compliance with fundamental principles of the rule of law. Poland, by the way, the biggest net receiver of EU funding uh, within the European Union, are the Germans right to be looking into that? They are, they are. And uh, I mean, this migrant crisis uh, has been very poorly handled by, by the EU so far. I mean, we've seen the Italian asking for help, uh, Frontex is not there uh, up to speed, and the countries are not doing their share and the part of the, of the, of the job. Even France, we, we do not uh, take the, 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 the load of migrants in our countries. And nothing has been done in Brussels to impose or to say, you have to work and we have to work together with 28. And it's part of being uh, the humanist uh, mission of Europe is saying we have to be a land of asylum for these people uh, looking for, uh, for peace and freedom. All right, so there should be yeah. there should be a uh, pe penalties if you don't play by the rules of the 28, says Eric C. But I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I want to thank Dominika Kozic for being with us uh, from Brussels. I want to thank uh, David Kedje and Nicholas Richardson in Warsaw. Stay with us. Yeah. Media Watch is next. Yeah, emotions running high. We say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. Emotions running high between uh, Warsaw and Brussels. That's right. And you can certainly see that on uh, social media. Uh, just a couple of uh, tweets uh, showing what the public are thinking, but also what MEPs are thinking and how it's playing out uh, online in any case. The law putting the Supreme Court under political control has been adopted. This is an image showing, uh, I suppose, how some people in Poland feel about that, resisting uh, that move and that that was a protest 
uh, today. Um, as you can see people kicking, basically, from a lying down position, the barrier that was put up by the police. So certainly tensions in within Poland as well, never mind between Poland and other parts of uh, the European Union. Amnesty International, many other NGOs, uh, very much a, a negative on this in terms of what they're expressing. EU threat threatened to trigger Article 7. It, this is positive from the point of view of, of Amnesty EU, unsurprisingly. Uh, it shows a serious threat, tre treatment of assault on, the judi on judicial independence in uh, Poland. So they are in favour of the EU's strong uh, rejection of this move. Poland leaving the EU community of values. That's one quote that is being lifted there, a quote by Manfred uh, Weber, the German head of the centre-right EPP group. Uh, so that is the feeling of many in the European uh, Parliament. And that is Manfred Weber. They're actually tweeting, saying it is a sad day for Poland. We call on President Duda in charge of safeguarding the constitution to veto this un cons yeah. these unconstitutional laws. The Germans again outspoken on this. That's right. A lot of pressure uh, coming to bear there. Um, without independence, there is no justice. This is another uh, um, MEP, Vivian Redding of Luxembourg. Without justice, there is no rule of law. The EU must react strongly and stand by Poland's people. So that's very strong language really coming from prominent uh, members of the European Parliament saying that Poland is leaving the, unit, the EU's community of values, that they're, that they're uh, basically turning their back on the rule of law. It's um, highly critical uh, language. Now, on the other hand, you're seeing uh, others... Uh, who are perhaps anti-EU, uh, saying that uh, uh, Brussels' attitude is akin to dictatorship. The EU is threatening to remove Poland's voting rights because it doesn't agree with the, with internal politics. Dictatorial Brussels says uh, this particular uh, article. You can see these are a lot of alt-right uh, articles that are being shared here, shared here or, or uh, Twitter accounts that are in favour of Brexit. So I suppose the writing is on the wall in terms of where they are positioned vis-a-vis uh, -vis Brussels. It is almost as if the EU wants Poland and the Weisgrad nations to go it alone. Now, the Weisgrad nations, that is a reference uh, to this particular group, uh, which is Poland, Hungary, uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And uh, they have formed a group which is, I suppose, meant to speak up in, in, in favour of their common interests uh, migration and accepting of refugees being one. And of course, they have a strong line position where they don't want to take in uh, many. So that uh, V4 report, that is in reference to that same group, Poland will not allow outside powers. This is somebody, obviously, just a, a regular person using Twitter who seems to be in favour of uh, of these four countries forming a common interest group. Poland will not allow outside powers from east or west to dominate them again. Merkel and EU fairies are about to meet Polish, the Polish reality. So a lot of kind of strong language there on social media. It's people, some defending Poland's sort of uh, anti-EU stance in this, uh, in this regard. And just one final comment from that same Twitter account, uh, lashing out at EU leftists in Brussels for trying to break the unity of the V4 group. So you can certainly see fractures emerging in, in the EU uh, when it comes to uh, big questions like migration or I suppose, justice. How do Eurozone nations handle the Visegrad group now? Well, quietly. I mean, there's been no, no clash right now, but uh, it's surely one of the big threats uh, to come uh, for what the EU is going to be in the coming years. And surely Macron will have something to say. The French president newly elected has some ideas for Europe, and he will have to put something on the table for the Visegrad uh, group. All right. So it's a subject we'll revisit with you, perhaps, yeah, Eddie Zipperna. Yeah. And many pleasure. thanks, James Creighton. Thanks, Francois. I want to thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.